I'd like to give you a warning that this is a boring sermon. Okay. So if you're, if you're someone who doesn't like boring sermons, you, you can just like really try to grit this one out and uh, next week will maybe be more exciting. If you're someone who loves boring sermons, this is for you. Why are we here? That's interesting, on my vacation, I, I always try to like go to a church service because it's, it's very delightful going to a church service where I'm not like in charge of things. Uh, and also because for why we're here. Because ultimately we, we don't want to be here just, just for fun or, or entertainment, like, or because we have some sort of guilt about, you know, maybe what we've done this week and like, man, maybe if I go to church, I can just sort of like even the scales with God. I know, but we're here for Jesus. Jesus who saved us on the cross to catch a glimpse of him, to know who he is, to find our joy in worshiping together. That's why we're here. Like we're here, we're here to see Jesus Christ. Now, as we've been going through Proverbs, we've been going through this series, which were is kind of a break from the series, the Ten Rules for Life, which is all about like the practical advice for Proverbs, like how to live your life. But I want to take just like a step, like not maybe back, but just out of that kind of lane to look at this one question where is Jesus in the book of Proverbs because that's that's what we want to see we want to see Jesus in the book of Proverbs so let, let, let's pray Lord God I pray I pray Lord that you would reveal Jesus to us today that we would see you as you are revealed to us in your word, these ancient words ever true. So be with us, Lord God, revealed to us by your spirit, Jesus Christ, anew. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, we just read this text, and hope you're paying attention as we, as we stood to listen. As I sit down, it's like, man, we should just stand for this. And then Janice was like... Amazing how that happens. We have this I wisdom dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. A little, little while later, we have this like this character of wisdom. I was daily his delight in verse 30, rejoicing before him always. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work. The first of his acts of old, verse 22. And I suspect there's, there's a little more than the kind of, kind of base read. So, so, so read this text and, and you think, okay, wisdom is a literary device that Solomon is using to make wisdom more personal. So it's like, like a friend. And so, so we read wisdom as this, as this literary device. But, but as you read, it, it's kind of like, feels like maybe a little more is going on. Like, like wisdom takes on this very like strong character. Now, this is God's word and it's supposed to be meditated on. And, and we want to read it carefully because it's, it's easy to make two mistakes. So you can read God's word and you could just be like surface reading over and you just skim through it and you don't get like much into it. But there's also like the other mistake you can make is that you can like read God's word and you start seeing things that maybe aren't there. <laughs> You start reading in kind of readings, and I've, I've listened to preachers preach sometime. I'm like, oh, I don't think it actually says that. And so this is like, 
you can read too much into things. You read, can read too little into things. But we want to be able to hear what God is saying in any text of the Bible. So, what is it talking about? So is wisdom merely an anthropomorphism? I warned you that this was going to be a boring sermon. This is the first of the boring words. Anthropomorphism is when a non-human thing is sort of imbued with human-like properties to teach us a lesson. I know kids, you're like, oh, I'm just about to start school. I don't want to be learning yet. But okay, this is important because we can see folly as a kind of anthropomorphism, as like this loud woman, a prostitute inviting the simple in, and it's sort of giving all of the dumb things people do to wreck their lives a person. And then it kind of does the same thing with wisdom. It gives wisdom a kind of personality to show what is a wise person. And yet, as you read the verse, you get down to something like verse 22. Verse 22 says, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. And you kind of wonder if there's something more going on. 20, verse 23, Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. And the text goes on to point out how this thing, like kind of like separate from God, is, is there as a, as a master workman beside God. And God actually delighted in wisdom. Now, as we read God's word, especially in the Old Testament, we, we always want to read God's word as if it's a little bit transparent. I don't know if you guys, you guys have a Bible that has thin pages. Most of you do. Everyone's got Bibles with thin pages. And has anyone ever highlighted their Bible? Yeah, if you highlight your Bible and you like look at one page and one page is highlighted, you can actually like see the highlight from the page behind. So, so you're looking, you're reading that text, but there's that little like bit like bleeding through. Now in the same way, when we read the Old Testament, we always want to read it with a little bit of transparency to see through to the end of the story, to see Jesus Christ in his finished work on the cross bleeding through the page. And so we want to like look like, how is this revealing Jesus? Because Jesus is God's final revelation. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, long ago, At many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. So like like Jesus is when God spoke finally, period. And so as we read these words from Proverbs, we read looking forward to Jesus. So is wisdom more than a literary concept? Is wisdom actually Jesus, the preexistent word of God? Now, we need to talk about this for two reasons. One is that when I read it, I like get a little twinge, like something's going on here. And two is that for the vast history of the church, I know you're guys saying like boring sermon, history again. Go back to Justin Martyr in the second century. He is pointing to this text in Proverbs 8 as like, this is Jesus in the Old Testament. In fact, most of the church, almost all of the church fathers and most people up to pretty recent days interpret it as wisdom being Christ. And the only like alternatives like Irenaeus, he was in the second century, he thought that wisdom was the Holy Spirit, something we'll talk about in a little bit as well. Now, this is really important to a debate in the early church, again, history, 
back in Alexandria of Egypt, which was a center of learning in Egypt, there was one of the most important theological debates. And that was a guy by the name of Arius made this claim. And he was said that Jesus is like God, but not actually God. He said this, if the father begat the son, he was... He, he that was begotten had a beginning of existence. Hence is that there was, there was when the son was not. In fact, the Arian supporters, that was their slogan. They would go around the streets of Ari Alexandria shouting, there was when he was not. It's kind of a catchy phrase. Maybe it's a little catchier in Greek. <laughs> now, this question of who Jesus is, is not some idle, historic bit of trivia. But it's, but it's vital, because if, 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 if we're going to be singing, like, give me Jesus, if we are going to be worshiping the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he is either God, and we are doing the right thing, or we are idolaters, because Jesus himself said, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Still today, the devil is trying to discredit Jesus Christ. Propping up ideas and false cults and false religions that Jesus is special or a prophet or somebody, but not quite God. Jesus is not quite God. We're all idolaters and doomed. Now, this is all important because the Arians had a proof text. And their main proof text that they argued at the Council of Nicaea was from Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22. The Lord created me as the beginning of his works before his deeds of long ago. Now, verse 22, and everyone's going to read a translation. Everyone's going to say something slightly different because uh, I told you this is a boring sermon. Okay, another reason for boring. So there are two words. One, one word in Hebrew means created, and the other word means possessed or gave birth to or something like, like possessed is probably, probably the best, something like, like the acquired. And strangely enough, both those words are spelt exactly the same way. Okay? A great way to get into a, a theological debate on something that's kind of insolvable. Now, I think in context, I think created is probably a good translation, at least defensible, but I'm not entirely sure. But... But it's, uh, okay, so create. Moving on. All right, let's get to the New Testament. So why in the world did the early church think, basically without a doubt, that Proverbs 8 was speaking of Jesus? After all, it doesn't say Jesus, and it's a little oblique. But first of all, Christ is the wisdom of God revealed. 1 Corinthians 1.22, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Although not worldly wisdom at all. Secondly, this text goes about, one of the main things is, is that wisdom is there when God is creating all these things in the world. And what do we have Christ doing in the New Testament? Creating, Colossians 1.16, for by him all all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or, or authorities. All things were created through him, that is Christ, and for him. In Proverbs 8, we see wisdom really present in creation. Proverbs 8, 29, when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters might trans, not transgress his commands when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman and I was daily in his sight or I was daily his delight. 
rejoicing before him always. Again and again, Hebrews 1, 2, through whom he created the world, through Jesus Christ. And who can forget John 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yes, all you cults over there, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And that sounds so tantalizingly similar to Proverbs 8. 8.23, ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there was no depth, I was brought forth. When there was no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. So, here... Wisdom is there with creation. And this is why the early church was, was so quick to, gla- to, to grab hold of this concept that Jesus, as the wisdom of God, is wisdom in Proverbs 8. And they had such a fierce debate about Proverbs 8, 22, which says, The Lord possessed or created me at the beginning of his work the first of his acts of old. Now, I just want to like like put that aside for just like one minute because this next little part is important because we want to think about the Holy Spirit's relation to wisdom in just a second because it's important for us as Christians. This is what Irenaeus thought. And the Old Testament calls wisdom, this way of living rightly in the world. And then we get to, to James 1, 7, and it talks about this as wisdom, uh, wis- James chapter 3, verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And James like calls this thing wisdom. And this list sounds so familiar because it's so close to the fruit of the Spirit text in Galatians. And if you just think about it for, for a minute, like, like Proverbs is given so that we can live rightly in the world. Now, the Holy Spirit is given for, to empower being a seal, but it's also given to make Christians holy. It's a gift so that we display the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And in that way, the Holy Spirit is similar to Proverbs and wisdom, except for the crucial difference that Proverbs comes to us in a book written in the letter while the Holy Spirit writes these things and prints them on our hearts. It's also remarkable that the Holy Spirit, again, is mentioned in creation. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, it could be a way of saying the presence of God was over the waters, not a reference to the Holy Spirit, but maybe not. Now, there's a connection simply because the wisdom of a life that we live as Christians is the wisdom communicated by the Holy Spirit. Now, in summary, the New Testament teaches that Christ as the Word was active in creation. And there is a connection between the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And so, as we look at this text, how are we to understand it? There are so many similarities between Jesus and the Lady Wisdom in Proverbs. Both existed before all things. Clearly, like wisdom existed before all things, John in the beginning. Both played a role in creation. Both descended from heaven and were given to humanity, but were rejected by the masses, as we still see folly more more honored than wisdom. Both teach a heavenly wisdom. 
Both lead those who listen to life and immortality and threaten death to those who ignore the advice. Maybe most interesting, both offer blessings in the symbols of food and drink. If you remember two weeks ago how wisdom sets out a meal, Christ himself gives us a meal. Now, in all these tantalizing things, it's so easy to be like, well, look, it's like wisdom there. I think we need to see that even though wisdom is presented as this great thing, wisdom pales in comparison to the Lord Jesus Christ. For the queen of Sheba rejoiced in Solomon and his wisdom, but something far greater is Jesus Christ. God, I think the text says, created wisdom, but Christ is begotten of the the begotten eternal son, God from the beginning uncreated. Wisdom witnessed creation, but all things were made through the son. He was the word, the power of God in creation. Wisdom lasts at the time of judgment, but Christ is the judge. Wisdom is begotten by God. Christ is God. In Solomon, and ultimately in the book of Proverbs, as with the whole Old Testament, you have a kind of truth that fails by itself. In in Solomon, we see this. Solomon was the son of David who... He was the son of David who gave us so much wisdom, but in the end was an idiot who didn't, who didn't ignore the women that he warned us about. Only Christ is the son of David. Christ is the son of David who was righteousness to the end. Now, When we look at this, I think we should interpret this as this way, is that wisdom is a type of Christ in that wisdom points, wisdom points to Jesus Christ as the son who would walk in the very image of God, who would live in complete wisdom in everything he does. Wisdom would point to Christ, but not be Christ. Now, this happens all the time in the Old Testament. Things that point to Christ in a specific way, but are not Christ. My favorite example of a type of Christ in the Old Testament is favorite, ah, oh, there's no middle, middle school boy, favorite middle school boy, Old Testament character, got lots of muscles. Can you guess? Samson, Samson, yeah, Samson. Samson, great hero, um, also maybe consorted with not the best women. Uh, Delilah was not a great life choice. But he was a type of Christ in one very important way, is that at the end of his life, chained with pagans between two pillars, he saved Israel by sacrificing himself. And so that that one thing points to Jesus, the one who would die for his people. In the same way we read wisdom, which in so many ways has these echoes of Jesus Christ, looks forward to a life of a person who actually gives a meal for us to take and live. And yet, in the Old Testament, is not the thing itself. Wisdom is a a created thing, a thing that that points to the ultimate. Wisdom is a type of Christ, but not Christ himself. Christ is the giver of wisdom. Ephesians 1.17, the Lord, that that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Christ isn't the equivalent of wisdom, but the giver of wisdom. 
Colossians 2, 2 to 3, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so wisdom is a, is a, is a, is a part of Jesus that he gives to his followers as they seek him. So why does this matter? First, we need to come to Jesus Christ and not just come and be wise. It's so tempting so often to seek out things that just are like shortcuts to live our life better. I look at, I was like popular sermon series, like how to live a wise, prosperous, and healthy life. Like, like people like looking at it, like that's what I want. It's like, like that's an okay thing to have, but what I want to do is seek Jesus Christ. He is everything, and wisdom is a byproduct of seeking him. But just being wise without him leads to the same tragedy as Solomon. When we read the book of Proverbs, we do really need to look at the text because this is God's communication to us. And, and, and reading this is like wisdom and good for us, but to be applied, looking through the page to the ultimate of Jesus Christ. And I just like implore you, anything that you set out for in life is that, is that whatever God has laid on your heart to chase in your life, that you're always looking through that thing to the ultimate glory of God in Jesus Christ. I mean, I just got to go to the mountains, and man, mountains are awesome. Like, why do we live here sometimes, I think? <laughs> mountains are so awesome. Of course, I look at house prices there, and then I think, oh yeah, that's why I live here. But if you just look at like something glorious like that, it's not enough just to see it. It's not enough just to see it because those mountains, they're like pointed in the sky like that for a reason. So that you look up and remember the creator who made those things. In the same way, we look at wisdom, we look at how to live a wise life, and in every one of them, when we step and we walk into them, we look at them not as the mountains just to enjoy as themselves but to enjoy it as we see the peaks of loftiness and look up to the creator of all things. And so, when we read Proverbs, anything in the Old Testament, let's look to Jesus Christ and worship him. And in our lives, let us look to Jesus Christ in whatever we do and worship him. For in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, I pray that you would reveal yourself to us, that we would see Jesus Christ, who is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And in doing so, you would transform us as we read your word, as we seek after you, and as we, as we grow day by day, not by ourselves and not for ourselves, but to you and to your glory alone. May we never be wise without Jesus Christ and ultimately be a fool, but only look to Jesus in all things. Lead us, teach us, focus our minds again in all things. In Jesus' name we pray.